Tonight we welcome Sam Lipsight to discuss his new novel, Hark. Hark is a wickedly funny social satire that looks closely at questions of meaning and how we can keep balance in a world that seems seriously askew. Hark exhibits Lipsight's potent blend of spot-on satire, menacing bit players, and deadpan humor as it considers and grapples with how hope can exist in a moment saturated with information and dread. Sam Lipsight is a novelist and short story writer, um, author of many novels and collections, including Homeland, a New York Times notable book, and winner of the first annual Believer Book Award. He has been a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and currently teaches at Columbia University in New York. Now please join me in welcoming Sam Lipsight. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know this is being billed as a conversation. For a while, it's going to be a one-way conversation because I'm going to read to you from the book, uh, and then we can you can ask me some questions. Uh, I don't really because it's fiction. I don't really do, create talks around the books. I just they talk for themselves. So I will just read from uh, this book that just came out the other day, and I guess you heard a little description of it. So. I won't set anything up. I'll just start from the beginning. <clears throat> Listen, before Hark, was it ever harder to be human? Was it ever harder to believe in our world? The weather made us wonder. The markets had, the wars. The rich had stopped pretending they were just the best of us and not some utterly other form of life. The rest, the most, could glimpse their end on earth in the parched basins and roiling seas, but could not march against their masters. They slaughtered each other instead, retracted into glowing holes. Hark glowed too. He came to us and was goldeny. It wasn't that Hark had the answer. It was more that he didn't. All he possessed, he claimed, were a few tricks or tips to help people focus. At work, at home, out for coffee with a client or a friend. Listen, before Hark, was it ever harder to find focus? Hark gathered his tips together, called it mental archery. Pretty silly, he liked to say. But some knew better. Some were certain he had a secret, a mystery, a miracle. For what was mental archery but the essence of Hark? And what was the essence of Hark but love? In this hurt world, how could that hurt? The hunters of meaning had found no meaning. The wanters of dreams were dreamless. Many now drifted toward Hark Mourner. This is like the back story. The front story is about a bunch of people and a movement they launched under the banner of Hark. A movement that maybe meant nothing at all. Or maybe it did mean something. It's tough to tell. The past is tricky, often half-hidden, like a pale, flabby young man flung naked into a crowded square. The past doesn't stand there, Grant Ganders. The past clasps its crotch, scurries for the cover of stanchions, benches. History hides. That's its job. It hides behind other history. Fraz Penzig, one of the front story people, knows all about it. He used to teach some history, though he hasn't taught it in a while, not since the middle school cut staff by a third. His wife, Tova, told him that life is not a zero-sum game, but Fraz senses that if it were, he would be the zero-sum. Lucky for him that Tova is still employed. He's grateful for the medical, though he happens to have his health at the moment. Not that it's something you can ever truly own or bequeath, like a house or a houseboat, or a parcel of land in the hills, but Fraz does have his health. Oh, maybe he feels frail on occasion, a tad pulped, bones shot, frequently fevered, on the verge of the verge of death, but make no mistake, he's hardy. His twinges, his spasms, his stabby aches, they're chronic, like all the other minor hurts, the gym injuries, the sprains achieved mysteriously on the can. He's terminal, but not quite near the terminus. Like when he had that raisin on his head, went to the raisin doctor. It's nothing, the doctor said. Nothing? I mean it's something. 
It's just what people get on the way down. You want to lightsaber that bad boy off? Also, 46 years on this hard turd of a world, and Fraz's mind is still by his light's pure silk. He knows younger types already fried or brined, not just with drugs or booze, but merely from rising in the morning, moving about in their private biospheres of panic and decay, the hours at work, the hours of work at home, the hours of work with spouses, fathers, mothers, children, the stress is laced into the simplest tasks, the fight or flight responses to kitchen appliances, not to mention the mighty common domes with which the individual bubbles ven, the fouled sky, the polluted food, the pharma-fed rivers full of sad-eyed oxytrout, the genes on outlet shelves and their modalities of size, skinny fit, classic fit, fat shepherd fit, all died a deep cancer blue, and the wave rot, of course, the pixel-assisted suicide, the screens, the screens, the screens. Yes, Fraz is lucky, privileged if you please, not just to be alive, but to still live here, his locus, his home grove, the city that never sleeps, but paces its garret in a nervous rage, the city of his kin. Once he had some vague ambitions, semi-valuable skills. Now he tutors school kids part-time, does favors for an old friend of his late father. He's lucky Tova's affections don't hinge on his ability to generate revenue. Or maybe her affections hinge on nothing now. But fie on such wallow world musings. Fie on these flurries of own negs. Today he will shrug off the cape of self-hate. Fraz has upsides. He's a doting father. He's one of Hark's apostles. He spreads the word. Also, he's rich in nutrients, solid from the gym, with, despite a certain overspreading doughiness, some noteworthy detail on his tries and delts. Truth is, he'd rather be a male waif. But he got Jude, he can say it, on the genetics. His narrow band of endomorphic choice will always come down to this, lard barn or semi-cut chunk. Today, he's headed downtown for a meeting with the Mental Archery Brain Trust. Kate Rumpler, the young heiress who funds their institute. Teal Baker Cassini, the discipline's leading intellectual light. And Hark Mourner himself, their radiant, inscrutable guru. They will take their booth at the Chakra Khan, sip kale and peppermint toddies. They have much to discuss. Demonstration videos, scheduled appearances. The True Arrow, a new feed on Hark Hub. Fraz wishes they could meet at a coffee bar, or a full-service bar, or a full-service meat cart. He likes the street meat, the tangy skewers. He doesn't mind the toddies, but the candles, the garden scents, menace his dainty machismo. Listen, such are the sacrifices one makes for the cause, for mental archery, for love. Today, Hark and Fraz ride north toward some bluffs above the Hudson. Pickering, New York, once the largest manufacturer of frozen waffles in the country, has invited Hark to speak on the rudiments of mental archery. Near the town, an ancient billboard juts from a cliff. Boys in earth-toned plastic helmets clutch honey-brown frost-stippled discs. The tagline reads, Gentlemen, start your toasters. Fraz recalls this ad campaign from his childhood, though he remembers it as, Gentlemen, start your waffles. Could the company have survived longer with his version? Fraz berates himself for foolish speculation, then berates his inner berater for stifling winsome or playful thoughts. For from such lazy perambulations through the noggin's grottos, profundity can effloresce, ideation's lush, dark bloom. But now he's thinking too much. Clumps of overthought thoughts accrue, cloud him. Fraz switches to a vacant setting, watches the roadside world slide by. Fields, houses, malls, rivers, malls. In mental archery, this is called unstringing your bow. Hark unstrings his bow a lot, falls into silence, self. Fraz turns from the window to study Hark, the soft electrics of those gold-flecked green eyes, the ninja sinews in his neck, the spiky, creamy meringue of his hair. Sometimes Hark appears born of a fabled tribe from a fold in space. Today he's a young man on a bus. He hunches, scribbles in a battered yellow journal. 
When Hark does speak, his voice is an enchanted river with roars and hushes and thick crystal swerves. It carves a course for Fraz to follow, to flow toward, out from his fetid backwaters, his brack stink. Fraz met Hark by chance in a bookstore. He ducked in out of the summer heat to kill time before a tutoring gig. The streets were a hot, greasy griddle, and Fraz was bent on the assassination of a tiny segment of time. Also, he wanted a book. He was depressed about the political situation, and he wanted a book that was either about the political situation or not about the political situation at all. This book would either explain with unerring exactitude the intractable shittiness of the political situation, or it would transport him to another place, a magical forest of shittinesslessness, for example, or perhaps transport him to another time, a time that did not flinch in the face of Fraz's determination to kill it, that did not almost literally, but not obviously literally, fall to its knees if time can be said to have knees, which surely it can't, and beg for its feckless life. Yes, he was depressed. Or was he just sensitive? Maybe his was the reasonable response to the situations, the political situation, the economic situation, the situations at home with Tova and the kids, or to bring it into Harky and focus a bit more, the Tova situation, what was actually probably literally known to Tova as the Fraz situation. One had to see his perspective on these things. He could sense Tova's displeasure, her weariness, the qualities in Fraz she once claimed to adore, were maybe not such adorable qualities anymore. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Tova's on the train with the twins. She sits between them, keeps them yoked in relatively loose pro-wrestler chokeholds. They are temporarily immobilized and thus unable to assault each other or fellow riders, both of which are distinct possibilities with these maniacs, especially this morning. Meanwhile, she texts emendations to her supervisor's proposal to the provisional head of development at the Blended Learning Enhancement Project. Her supervisor, Cal Kronstadt, possesses what Tova knows the business community deems leadership qualities, meaning he's equal parts fool and lout, a human facsimile on a ceaseless quest to collect his salary and cover his butt. Apropos of which, the reason she's here on the subway restraining her kids in semi-legal grappler grips instead of already at her desk is because one or both of her children have, as she put it as concisely as she could on the phone to the doctor, concerns of the ass. More specifically, ass worms. Tova may have ass worms too. What happened was that all of their assholes started to itch and Tova looked this symptom up discovered a detailed photograph of a hairy, nearly microscopic worm. Somebody had earned enough trust from this creature to achieve a lively, candid shot as the critter regarded the camera with unamused scorn, mostly expressed through what Tova supposed were eyes, but on further inspection might have been anal orifices themselves. Tova tried to call Fraz, but hasn't been able to reach him. He could be tutoring or doing a favor for Mr. Dirsch, or, most likely, cleaning and jerking, perhaps at the gym, more likely at home. The twins' noses nearly touch in Tova's double clinch. Jesus, Mom, stop, let me go, David says. Seriously, says Lisa. Hush it, guys. The names of her children sometimes embarrassed Tova. They were Fraz's idea. He had declared himself the creative one, which is how people, men, describe themselves when they aren't the competent ones. Tova has a degree in poetry and two chapbooks, even if that was a thousand lives ago, but somehow he bulldozed her on the kids' names. Tova loosens her choke grips. The twins flop back in their seats, rub their necks, groan. They peer about the car for pitying looks, or perhaps an undercover agent from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Bitchfuck Moms to bust their mother for abuse. But the other rioters, ingrates, ignore them. Grown-ups are sick, thinks Lisa, and maybe David does too, since their eight-year-old twin minds beam thoughts and emotions back and forth, or at least that's what it feels like, or what people tell them it's supposed to feel like. Tova asks her children if their assholes still itch. Not as much, David says. Not as much, Lisa says, mimics the high, sweet tone of her brother's voice, reaches out for a nasty flick of his earlobe. Mom, she's bullying me. Live with it, Lisa says. Both of you stop at once. 
Tova's itch is faint at best. Could it be that new cheap detergent Fraz bought so proud of his thrift? She never did see a worm, except in the photograph, but it looked so real and wanting to nestle in the rectums of her family. Did she overreact? How can an overworked working mother overreact? The intestinal canals of your precious spawn teem with maggots. Your husband slacks off on a job that barely keeps him in breath mints, and your dolt of a supervisor gets promoted based on your due diligence. Overreaction is an impossibility. Maybe the doctor will have some cold, soothing cream. A nice, cooling ointment or salve in her butt could absolve this galling day, so long as Fraz doesn't figure it for a goddamn invitation. Okay, I'll just read a little bit more. A little bit more fun marriage stuff. <laughs> this morning in the shower, oh, and I see a theme developing here. This morning in the shower, attempting to jet wash his anus from a frisk position against the tiles, Fraz had an epiphany. He knows epiphanies are passe, but this one overcame categorical obsolescence. Triptych, women and sadness. Fraz will make a film in three sections, each about a woman who is beautiful and sad, and how the principles of mental archery might free her from the fetters of Anadonia. His mother will be the first panel, Tova the second. The film will employ a rigorous neo-emo sensibility, warts and all, but also in parts wartless. What is beauty? Is it truth or just random molecularity? Is beauty in the eye of the beholder? Does it crush the beholder's eyeballs, the souls of the beheld? Plus, what is sadness? Plus, what are women? He will take on the tough questions. Maybe he will learn something about his subjects or himself. Maybe he will learn how to talk to Tova again. He's been working on that. They both have in their counseling sessions with Teal. This was Hark's idea. After Fraz mentioned that he had a Tova situation and that Tova had a Fraz situation, Hark suggested they embark on some couples therapy with Teal who had not completed the clinical qualifications for her social work degree, but whose life wisdom and experience with mental archery might compensate. Tova scoffed, but agreed to one session, after which she was converted. Here was a person, she told Fraz, who could comprehend Tova's pain with proper nuance. Teal was brilliant, like Tova, and had done time, which Tova sometimes felt like she was doing with Fraz. Fraz recalls an exchange from a recent session. Tova. I just feel this distance. Like when Fraz makes a joke, I know even before he's finished that I won't find it funny. Whereas I used to laugh at all his jokes. We laughed so much together. Now, even if we're watching a comic on TV, like an intelligent, funny one, if Fraz laughs, I just shut down, get distant, icy. It's me, really. Teal, what do you mean, you? Tova, when I'm not happy, I disassociate. I'm somewhere else for a while. Fraz. It's true. It's like she's on another planet. A glaze comes over her face. It's like she's teleported out of her body, left it there to operate on autopilot. Teal. Where are you, Tova? Where do you go? Tova. I don't really know. It's a brightly lit place. Well scrubbed. Kind of rustic. A farmhouse. There's a man there. He's tall and lean with a beard. We're together and we're safe. Fraz. Sounds like your father. I don't know where the farmhouse comes from. Tova, I like farmhouses. Teal, is this man your lover? Tova, I don't think so. It's just that we keep each other safe. Teal, do you have lovers in this rustic place, this safe farmhouse setting? Tova, I'm satisfied. It's like the whole deal, the farmhouse, the field, the trees. They are all my lovers. Fraz, she'd rather fuck the scenery than me. Teal, accept it. Fraz, what? Or fight for her. Fraz, fight her rural fantasia? Teal, you want her back on your ding-dong? Fraz, yes. Teal, then string your goddamn bow and declare war on her dumb fuck bourgeois fantasia. Tova, you have to destroy my fantasia, Fraz. Fraz, is this what couples therapy is normally like? Teal, I don't know, I just started. Okay, I'll read one more little bit. 
This is much later in the book. And uh, the daughter, Fraz and Tova's daughter, Lisa, has had a, an accident and she's in the hospital. And look, as you may have gathered, there's a, a movement called Mental Archery and Hark is their leader. And they have, they're going to all gather together and do a group focus to, uh, to try to heal Lisa. And, uh, and so a bunch of them are driving, driving up to, back to Pickering, the, the town we were hearing about earlier. Fraz rents another used Northern European sedan, collects Kate, Teal, Schnitz. Fraz has his driving moccasins, his baby tush gloves. His being is tuned to the life pulse of Lisa. It's not up to his daughter, whatever Dr. Musel thinks. It's not up to Tova or Nat Dersh or Marty Lenz or the Nazarene or Muhammad or Vishnu or Johnny Cash. It's up to Fraz and one other. Tova decides to stay by Lisa's bedside. I believe you believe, she tells Fraz, but I'm staying with my girl. Okay, says Fraz, just don't cock block the focus vibes. Get the fuck out now, says Tova. Fraz roars northwest toward Waffle Town. Teal navigates, or rather, provides play-by-play -play of the cobalt dots crawl across her phone screen. Meg Kenny, Hark's new spokeswoman, has confirmed that Hark will present himself at five that evening. A knocking, followed by a loosing. Thousands of imaginary arrows in the sky, the mass betrothal of spine and flex. Besides his one announcement last week, nobody has heard from Hark. Meg manages all communication. There is much chatter now on the Harkest street about her newfound command. She is a mystery to Fraz, but he surmises from her posts she is a passionate, she is passionate, dedicated to mental archery, in love with Hark, and possibly insane. Fraz shares his findings with Teal, who fidgets in the passenger seat, and Schnitz, who sprawls out and back with Kate, digs into a bag of something called soft chips. She's a Svengali Svengali, Teal says. Maybe, or she's exactly what this thing needs, or both. Look at this dumbass nation just flitting by our window, Schnitz says. Nothing but ignorance, poverty, disease, and Walmart, and Warmart. Please, Teal says. That's the old news. Still the only news. Hand up some of those shits, Fraz says, bends his palm back. Fraz bites into a soft chip. It isn't chewy or crumbly. It's an entirely new texture with a taste he would describe if somebody put a gun to his head, though it's hard to picture a scenario where somebody would put a gun to his head to ascertain the flavor profile of a new snack product as ineffable. Soft chips taste of a super abundant absence of taste. He wonders if soft chips, even more than climate change, are in fact the big one, the all snuffing meteorite. But that makes little sense. How about all of those other gastric apocalypses he's ingested over the years, from chocodiles to pop rocks to drinks iridescent as factory ponds? The dinosaurs were fucking crybabies. It's not about one big galactic boulder, but the ceaseless golden cancer shower. Soft chips is just another smoldering wedge from the stars. And what is Hark? What category of matter is the anointed one? Why pose the question if silence means that Fraz can be an arrow coursing through the air with all the others, each shaft angling out in midair to form a single point, a chevron of infinite focus and grace, a singularity, ultimate transcendence, blind, obliterating joy, love to the nth, the multiverse to the max, though Hark has never uttered such phrases. How strange to be Fraz, a fairly sharp guy raised by atheists and still want to believe in this stuff. But it's more than desire. Fraz does believe. Better to believe than accept his mother and father's miserable certainty, their sour invitation to the void. Better to believe than fetishize doubt, that dubious lodestar for all those sweat-bright wrestlers of faith. Besides, Hark is Fraz's destiny, both of their given names born of parental bewilderment. Then again, maybe it's all great heaps of horse shit. Oh dear. Is it time to don the damp, stinky singlet of consciousness, grapple with the mono dude once more? How's it going over there, Fraz, Teal says. Okay, I'm just getting manhandled by a spiritual crisis. Too much man fun, Teal says. A sign flicks by, pickering ten miles. Gentlemen, Fraz says, start your waffles. What, Schnitt says? You don't remember that? No. 
It's gentlemen start your toasters, Teal says. How would you know, Fraz says, were you even born? I'm reading about Pickering right now. Named for Priam Pickering in 1753, formerly known as, oh, this is good, his son Hector was hanged as a spy. Fucking lobsterbacks did that, Fraz says. Oh, I'll finish this. Fucking lobsterbacks did that, Fraz says. All of this revolutionary war stuff used to fascinate me, says Teal, until I realized it was just a fight among white guys. We were chattel either way. Fuck the whites, says Fraz. You're white. I'm Jewish. That's white. Tell Leo Frank. Who's Leo Frank, Schnitz asks. A Jew in Georgia. They lynched him. I've read about him, Teal says. But come on. The same guy gets mentioned every time. It's like if Crispus Attucks had been the only black man ever shot by the police in America. There is a lot of anti-Semitism in this country, Fraz says. It still won't be enough, Schnitz mutters. Please, Fraz says. Please, Fraz, Teal says. I'd worry more about your marriage. You still haven't told Tova and me what the root problem is. The root problem, says Teal. The root problem is that there are no roots, just destructive anxieties and bad faith. When were you going to tell us? I was hoping you'd figure it out for yourselves. It's a more profound discovery that way. Teal looks out the window, sees the cars parked along the roadside, still a mile clear of Pickering. Clowns, all of them, and she is no exception. Fine, but why must existence be so crushingly personal? She misses the days of middle school algebra, her gifted and talented study group, practice problems on the board. Solve for an X that wasn't you, or your fear, or your damage. She got good at that. But these were not practice lives no matter how it sometimes felt. Ask little Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, so I do have a wireless mic because we're filming. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I will get over to you as fast as I can. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about mental archery, because it seems like one of the things that's going on in the book is taking something that is sort of a medieval or ancient thing and then connecting it to a modernity that you're very skeptical of from the sound of it. So where's that coming from and how does that play out? Well, I think that it, I, one of the, the genesis for the book in some ways was looking at, and, and this kind of tracks in the book, although it's not really the part I read, but I was thinking about, first of all, the way everyone I know, including myself, is looking for some kind of uh, answer and seeing how much you know political life seems to have failed us in, in so many ways and civic life seems to have, have faltered. I see so many people reaching for various ancient practices, mindfulness practices, spiritual practices, and uh, so that's that's one part of it. I. Uh, and I think that what the book, I mean, ends up critiquing is more the way these movements go wrong when they become movements and go wrong when people try to commodify them or monetize them. Uh, and a, and a, a profit motive enters into it, which is what happens in the book. With mental archery, I kind of stumbled upon just this kind of goofy idea that there could be, you know, in, in yoga there are things like bow pose and things. But if you had a, a practice that was really just all archery, influenced and uh, and I sort of thought I could have you know in the book I say there are 52 poses uh, in mental archery and and they're named for uh, various figures from various traditions around the world because obviously every culture has some kind of archery tradition and uh, some medieval and ancient lots of ancient mythology has archers and medieval stories have archers and there's a a running gag about William Tell as well in the book. But uh, so it was kind of a pleasure for me to, to dip into all of those traditions and stories and create my own ridiculous mindfulness movement. Uh, and, you know, I think that I'm probably, you know, just, I guess I'm a failed cult leader. So all I can do is <laughs> dream, dream them up for the book. But that's, that was the, that's, I think that's how it started.
Hey, thank you so much again. Um, thank you. The, those passages really highlighted um, your wonderful sense of humor. Oh, um, I'm thinking back to uh, sharing a short story of yours with my coworker who is trained to become a doula, and I don't think I've seen someone laugh as hard as when she read that story about the male doula. Right, right. Um, so I was wondering, um, well, what do you think makes something funny? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, I find a source of humor in, in my work anyway is the gap, often the gap between what a character thinks is happening and what's really happening. Um, often the gap between what a character thinks he or she can control versus what is completely outside of their control. So sometimes that can be a source of humor. Uh, and sometimes it's sudden shifts in, in uh, scope can, can give us, and you know, humor is like, a lot of it is just a kind of the surprise of another angle, the, the, the shock of seeing something slightly askew and, and then seeing kind of it in a new light. And I think that humor, and very serious things sort of dovetail in, in those moments. And, and uh, that, that's the kind of humor that, that usually excites me the most. Also, I find a lot of humor in the way, even in the, with the best of intentions, we miscommunicate and we, you know, we're trying, we talk past each other. And, uh, and it's sad, but it's also kind of funny. Um, so uh, so I, I'm very interested in the, di the character dynamics uh, in this group and in some of the, the more intimate relationships in the book uh, to see how that plays out. I, I think, for me, there are two kinds of humor and they, I work with both of them, but one's more situational and it's about what's happening and one is more about how it's being uh, presented in language. And so the humor in a book is, can be quite different from the, you know, what would work on a stage in a stand-up routine or in a play. I mean, they're, they're kind of they're different, so I'm always interested in what makes a sentence funny, as opposed to just an idea that's funny. Like how do you land it? That's and that's something that I'm, you know, I try to do and I succeed and fail at different rates, depending. Was that basically? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Hi, Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you think your writing reflects solely? Uh, American or North American culture, or it will be understandable universally to people from other countries? Well, I think that what I can offer is, you know, a window onto a certain strain of North American culture. And uh, I think, I hope that I write it in a way that others will, can understand and, and, uh, and, and see. I don't, certainly don't claim to be speaking for anything else but I hope that it, it's of interest to all sorts of people. Um, I realize that when it's fiction that the characters uh, that you develop in your books aren't really real people, but I notice it That's seems very like- very important to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially because I have family here. But it seems like, yeah, I was thinking here, you know, you could start introducing members of your family, and these are characters <laughs> in the book. But um, it seems like some of the characters and, and the situations they have and the interactions are based on things from your life. And in a way, I mean, all of your books uh, to me seem to be about the same thing. Uh, people placed in a culture, a society where the situation is somehow difficult and how they maladapt to it. That's and and uh, I'm just wondering, like I even in this latest book, it seems like uh, some of the characters are people who actually appeared earlier. And I'm wondering, well, maybe those are just fictional characters, but that they're based on people in your life, uh, which are clearer in the early books when you're going back to like adolescence and that sort of thing. But um, I'm just kind of wondering, because to me, reading, reading these, well, the, the great things about the book, the books, one of the great things is the language. And you're <clears throat> pushing things to an extreme. And that's, I think, where the comedy comes from a lot of the time. But 
the way you do it also, I haven't finished this new book, but it can turn into a nightmare fairly quickly because you're looking at things that people, at daily lives and the way people live, and you're taking it just slightly to a new place, pushing it a little bit, and it becomes a little disturbing. So I, I don't know. that. I guess the question is um, how you see your characters informing um, what's going on in society, and where does that continuity come from? Well, first, thank you. I think I'll be taking you on the road with me to explain <laughs> my work. Um, uh, well, it's funny because some of the, you know, I'm, I always say it's not autobiographical, but it's emotion, there's a lot of emotional auto, autobiography. So, of course, you're drawing from a history of, of feeling and a history of thought and, you know, personal history of feeling and thought. And then various aspects of people in your life you can kind of blend together at times. And I mean, I, years ago, I got this phone call at midnight from three old college friends who were sitting around drinking and had all decided that they were the basis of a character in one of my books. And they, you know, they had taken bets and they wanted to know which one it was. You know, I handled it by saying it was all of them. But uh, <laughs> um, the other thing that's interesting that, so, I mean, I think most writers make up a lot of stuff and then draw from a lot of reality. But I think that uh, the strange thing, I think you were uh, pointing to this, a strange phenomenon that I've noticed now later in, in my career is that because there, I, I do, I have used characters in various books and they, they travel from book to book. And so Tova is a character who first appeared in some short stories uh, a while back in a book called The Fun Parts. And so I don't think of like her as a real person, but I am thinking of her as somebody who I'm tracking, who's now older, who's in a different stage of life, and it's the same person. And so I, it, in this imaginary world of, of, of you know, my, of my imaginary, she's she's gotten older and she's she has kids now, and, and what is she up to? And so that's a strange thing because you're not thinking about real people, but you are over time watching or accounting for their changes. And so they take on a, a strange life of their own, too. So I think both of those things happen. Yeah. Um, like the gentleman to my left, I really did appreciate the passage that you chose and the humor and the timing Thank of you. it all. Um, what I did notice is we were able to get into the heads of the characters of like Tova and even Lisa a little bit and Fraz and Teal, um, yet the main character is this guy Hark yes. and his mental archery. So I'm wondering, does the book ever go to in, into his head or point of view, or do you just get what it's about through the characters of other people? Well, yeah, that is the design of the book, the latter. And so That's there right. is a lot, there, is, you get, there are sections that are more biographical about Hark and you do learn sort of where he came from and, and you get a kind of a general sketch and the fact is is that this character Hart began as a stand-up comic and then sort of wasn't very good but there was something strangely compelling about him and uh, a booker started sending him to corporate retreats to do kind of be a kind of uh, gag speaker to kind of lighten lighten up you know lighten the mood after you know a morning of intense workshops or whatever and, uh, and then he started to kind of spout this insanity that he started to believe. And that's sort of, that's his genesis. And so we, we do hear a lot about Hark. But the design of the book, and I, I think that's important to understand that, or maybe it's not important, but it is to me, is that it is very much a book about how people project things onto Hark. And he's kind of a cipher in the middle. And so I think that's true of a lot of religious leaders, is like sometimes we don't really know every detail about them. We don't have the fine grain of their lives as they were, they were lived uh, because we want it a little fuzzy and we want it kind of mythic. And so that's what's happening in this book. We have stories about Hark and we have bits and pieces, but it's real, the, in terms of the conventionally developed characters, those are all the people around him. And we kind of are in their heads and learning how they're thinking about themselves in relation to Hark and in relation to other characters. But at the center is this thing that, this force that people are sort of, or a screen that people are projecting themselves on to. Oh, thank you. We have time for like probably two more questions. 
I won't take one from him. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Um, with the caveat that writing is uh, supposed to be difficult, um, a struggle that involves so much self-criticism, so much changes, so much so many revisions, are there aspects of your writing, your fiction writing, compared to maybe, let's go back to Homeland, that are easier now than they used to be? And that could be with the process, your ability to, to, um, to see uh, uh, insights or goals or to achieve them. And anything about that is easier or is easier or is it just as horrible as it used to be? <laughs> yeah, it remains horrible, but I think that, and the problem is once you write a book, you only have learned how to write that book and you're sort of back to square one in some ways. But it is true that the more you write and uh, you recognize dead ends faster. I think that's what it, it is. So like you, in when I was, Starting out, I would have to make a mistake for a long time before I realized it was a mistake. And I go in a di the wrong direction forever until I hit the wall. And I can start to recognize, oh, this never ends well when you do this. That, that kind of thought or, you know, that, that's not going to, whether it's on the level of a, you know, a, a paragraph or just a, the, a character's arc or a story point, whatever it is. I start to see, I recognize, oh, remember when you tried to do something like that and it didn't work that time? It's probably not going to work this time. And so you do pick, and I can't really give a concrete example, but that's the sort of thing that becomes easier. But then you're writing a different book and all these new problems present themselves and you don't know how to solve those yet. So it, maybe it balances out. We can do both take two. <laughs> Uh, hi. Uh, I was just curious about whether any particular like real life cults or movements, you know, provided ins inspiration in terms of you know the Hark thing or um, you know or uh, uh, yeah or events in the book. Yeah, I mean, I I think that I've always been fascinated by cults. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's being a little kid in the '70s has something to do with that. But um, I remember you know lots of hearing about cults all the time as a kid and. I remember movies about cults. And I, there was some. I was just thinking the other day about this movie I saw when I was really young that just stayed with me, and it was about uh, it was kind of like a Mooney kind of cult, and they it was called like Ticket to Heaven, I think. Did anyone ever see this? It's like Saul Rubinick, if you know who that is. But uh, anyway, he's uh, he's uh, it's about some people in a kind of Mooney style cult who are then deprograms, and but I remember there's like a scene where they're all there because you know they have to sell flowers on the side of the and there's they're doing their flower selling thing and they're chanting together bring in the money stamp out satan bring in the money stamp out satan and for, that's still you know that's when i go to sleep at night i just think bring <laughs> but uh, yeah i think that there have been a lot of you know and the of course like manson stuff and and it's not even you know i have to be honest it's not even, this is not even really my first book about a cult you know i my first novel had a cult in it. So I think I'm very much interested always in institutions. And so sometimes they're kind of more official institutions and sometimes they're, they're cults. But you know, cults can become religions, obviously. So uh, I'm, I, it's also a great way to bring disparate characters together. So it's kind of, that's maybe something that I'm drawn to as well as any excuse to get a, get a group of people in a room and this is a good one. But yeah, I am definitely drawn to that. At the risk of being one of those awful people who are like, I've got a comment and then a question. I, I've been thinking so much recently about how we got ourselves in this predicament, as many people are, and how, yes, the past informs the present, but how much the present informs the past. And that's something that I read in your in your books, right from Subject Steve, um, why does the present inform the past so sincerely in Hark? Why does it? Um, I don't know. It's uh, why does the present inform the past? Is that the question in this, in this book? Um, I guess I sometimes see some form of, of cyclical movement happening uh, in our history. You live long enough, you start to see things coming back around and you start to see attitudes you thought were gone resurface. Um, that's part of it. I started this book in 2012, 
And so this book is not some response, you know, necessarily just to the last few years. It's a it's a book that I was been working on for a long time and it didn't I didn't change much about it because I realize and you should know that it sort of veers off of history around well in, in my universe Obama only got one term and then there are these other a few other presidents and that's where we are in the present of the book. But uh you know in a in a way I mean obviously we're in this horrible place but I, and that's not a but. I just see, say, Trump. It's like you jump off a cliff. You don't blame the cliff. And in a way, Trump is the cliff. You know, what about us? What, what was making us move towards that in the first place? And how did we, how did we get that momentum going? That's that's a, another question that I think is a more interesting question. So, uh, so that's maybe some of the things that are in play in the book. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, can we get one more round of applause for Sam? That's wonderful. Thank you.